Yep. Good morning and welcome to the session on global risks. Uh, the 21st century is going to be either the best century ever, where we overcome the great challenges of poverty and diseases and many of the other things that afflicted us, or it's going to be uh, perhaps our last century, what Martin Rees has called our final century. Globalization has brought immense benefits, not least to China uh, and to Dalian, this wonderful city which we're in. But it also carries with it new risks. Integration brings opportunity. Interdependence brings risk. And complexity and population growth, density, and all the other benefits that have come from globalization bring with them new risks. So a small thing happening in one place ripples around the world in new and unprecedented ways. The financial crisis has demonstrated the first great systemic risk of the 21st century. And the pandemic flu that we've seen is another indication of the nature of systemic risk in the 21st century. These are different and substantively more rapidly transmitted risks, and their effect is much wider than any of the risks of previous centuries. This session will seek to address the question of what these major risks may be and how we may seek to address them. We have a wonderful panel which will be able to address various elements of this risk challenge and also help us think in an integrative discussion after they've spoken for a few minutes about the questions that you have in your minds about these risks. I'd like to begin by discussing the great challenge of food, water, and climate change. And I'm delighted to be able to have on the panel the head of IRI, the, one of the leading centers, not least the leading center in Asia on rice, thinking about these issues. And so without further ado, give a couple of minutes to Robert Ziegler to help us think about what is the big challenge in food? Uh, will we be running out of water? Will food be able to meet the needs of the rapidly growing population? And how will climate change affect this? And all of these very big questions in three minutes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think if we look at uh, what's happened over the last 50 years, there's uh, been a phenomenal economic growth uh, in Asia. And that's been built to a large extent on abundant, affordable food supplies. We've seen, however, that the, uh, the, effect, the impact of uh, the, the investments in the late 20th century uh, have, uh, has been tailing off. Yield uh, growth, productivity growth rates have declined. Uh, world grain stocks have been drawn down. And we saw the impact of that over, uh, over the last couple of years with skyrocketing uh, food prices. Uh, we have basically uh, some short-term concerns we've got to deal with and some, uh, some longer term. Uh, over the short term, the decreased investment in uh, research and development, new technologies, uh, allowing uh, infrastructure to deteriorate, uh, reduced investments in human capital development in agriculture, all have led to a stagnation. And that stagnation uh, has led to the, to the declining supplies. You put, combine that with competition, uh, for water, land, labor, we have a situation where our agriculture, our basic uh, uh, food supplies are, are, under, are under stress. Uh, over the longer term, uh, we have a situation of global climate change. Uh, my greatest concern as someone who works with rice is the uh, effect of rising sea levels. Most of the uh, increase in grain production over the last uh, 20 years has come from the Delta countries. Uh, Vietnam, Mekong Delta, Bangladesh, etc. Uh, as sea levels rise, those are under threat. If we're going to mitigate the risks that, uh, that are facing us, we are going to have to be investing now uh, uh, in solutions. And those solutions take 10, 15, 20 years to come down, the, come down the road. Thank you very much, and thanks for being brief. We move very quickly from the food issues to the health issues, and I'm delighted to have on the panel yeah. Pierre Schatz, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Kiergen from Germany. Uh, Pierre, we, we've seen in the news about pandemics. Uh, we're aware of the great risks of aging and health associated with uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and other diseases of the aged, and we don't even know about the new <coughs> challenges that are coming. 
perhaps man-made uh, in health. What do you see as the biggest risks in the health sector? And do you think the pharmaceutical and health sciences industry will be able to keep pace with these risks to ensure we have a better future, not a more dangerous one? Yeah, thanks, Robin. I think the, uh, the issue of health is one which is underappreciated as a risk factor because human beings uh, are extremely complex biological organisms, and such organisms have a, a trait that they change quite slowly and adapt quite slowly to changes in uh, the environment. Uh, we have a dramatic change in demographics right now. We have a dramatic change in globalization. We're exposed to new types of diseases. Uh, and I think it is underappreciated that human beings themselves have changed dramatically over the last uh, few hundred years. Uh, over the last 200 years, life expectancy went from under 40 years to about 70 years now in developed countries. Um, we are seeing dramatic changes in uh, fertility. We're seeing uh, degeneration even, especially in men, uh, losing muscle mass, uh, losing fertility, and having different traits uh, starting to emerge. These changes are so slow uh, that um, they are very often underappreciated because we typically focus on things that are very urgent. Um, I believe that we will need to realign some of the innovation and the resources that we have to some of these longer term trends because they are definitely coming and um, as we have seen they're already visible. Pandemics um, are one great example. We are now currently in the middle of one. Uh, the last major pandemic was a hundred years ago. Uh, this one might pass, it might not, uh, without uh, the most significant damage, but it will definitely come at some point in time. And we are grossly underprepared. We don't have vaccine manufacturing technologies that are adequate, and diagnostic testing technologies are also not equipped to be able to manage these types of uh, pandemics in the future. Thank you, uh, Pierre. Jeffrey, um, Jeffrey West is the president of the Santa Fe Institute, uh, which is one of the leading places in the world thinking about how you understand these and model these risks. And I'd like to ask you, uh, are you on top of the modeling of complex systems? What do you see as the biggest challenges in our intellectual understanding of how these risks relate to each other? Well, I think one of the first things you learn when you study complex systems is that um, it is extremely dangerous to deconstruct a system into its uh, components and into its individual parts. So if you translate that into questions of sustainability, it brings up the challenge that we tend to think of many of these problems in a kind of semi-autonomous way. So we think of the environment, we think of global climate change, we think of financial markets, economies, uh, urbanization, health, uh, disease, um, and um, uh, the, the kinds of things that are the modern challenges of the 21st century. And we see these semi-autonomously. And one of the things you learn when you think in terms of modeling complex systems um, which have the properties of uh, which you already mentioned, Robin, namely yeah. of uh, the analog to unintended consequences, namely a small effect in some place over here can have an enormous effect somewhere else, uh, the, the so-called butterfly effect. Um, that uh, one of the major things you learn is that it is dangerous to think of these in a deconstructed way. And one of the things that uh, it one it calls out for is a much more integrated, holistic, quantitative, predictive, conceptual framework. It requires nothing less than a rethinking in a systemic way about the totality rather than the question of looking at one aspect of the system, whether it be health or the environment or the markets, risk and so on, and seeing that as if we solve this, we can solve uh, the, the problem of sustainability. I must say that if you look at it from this viewpoint and you do serious modeling of such systems, I'm afraid you come away with uh, what you referred to as Martin Rees's viewpoint, that this may in fact be the last century, not maybe of human beings, but of the kind of life, the kind of advanced life, uh, socialized life that we've all become accustomed to, and uh, especially when you see that the driver of all of this is urbanization, and urbanization has been growing at a super exponential rate. It's the fount of all of our problems. It is also the fount of all our solutions, and yet, as a totality, we don't understand it, and complex adaptive systems as a way of thinking 
starts to allow you to address this, but I'm afraid the, the lesson is that there isn't time left given uh, the, uh, the signals that we've been having for the last 50 years. Thank you. Um, I hope we'll come back to this question of whether we have the capacity for a deep rethink of systemic risk uh, in the conversation that follows the panel. Uh, Ewan Michel Kajan is the managing director of the Wharton Risk Center, uh, and they are focusing on who pays and how do they pay for these uh, catastrophic and other risks. And Ewan, I'd like to hear a little bit about what will the balance be between the public and private sectors? Does government have the capacity to respond, if not the private sector? And can we imagine new instruments or other ways of dealing financially with some of these challenges? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, let me start with one uh, piece of evidence, which is uh, related to financial coverage of catastrophes. Been working on this issue worldwide for about 10 years now. If you consider all natural and man-made catastrophes that happened somewhere in the world over the past 40 years. So it's a pretty long period of time, 40 years. And if you look at the insurance coverage of these disasters, and if you consider the top 25 most costly disasters that happened somewhere in the world over the past 45 years, uh, more than half of them happened since 2001. Uh, this is what I've called the new era of catastrophes. You may like it, dislike it, but the evidence is here you will see more and more catastrophes that will cost more and more money. Uh, the question on the table now, on the table of CEOs all over the world, on the table of Prime Minister President is who's supposed to pay for that? Well, the insurance industry, which uh, many people don't know is one of the largest industries in the world today, continue to pay for it. Are we willing to um, pay the price of living in high-risk area? Uh, all of these issues are really uh, becoming strategic issues uh, worldwide. Um, just want to do some uh, publicity for the way if we put together uh, every year the Global Risk Report. I urge you to um, take a look at that. Uh, since over the past three years, we have been right on uh, pretty uh, much every level uh, financial crisis that we uh, highlighted four years ago. Food security, uh, I was highlighted two years ago. The food crisis happened six months later. So basically, who's going to pay for that? That's what is on the table today. Uh, two issues here. One, just to conclude, one on the OECD-type countries, you see more and more costly disasters, mainly because more and more people are living in high-risk area. So that's a simple part of the equation. Uh, what is more complex today is that because we're pushing for growth, 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 you get more and more emerging countries that become richer and richer, as you're becoming richer and richer, you want to protect your asset. Um, I was here in China two months after the earthquake working with the finance minister of China um, about a very simple or very complex issue, which is what type of insurance market you want to create here in China. So these are huge issues. You're talking about trillion of dollars of, uh, of coverage and whether insurance companies are going to continue to help uh, providing that coverage in one way or another, that's really the challenge we have on the table today or whether the uh, states are going to uh, uh, complement that coverage, that's what is on the table today. So if you're a company or CEO of a company, uh, the question is how much you should you pay for insurance or financial coverage for these uh, emerging global risk? Uh, most of them are not necessarily emerging. Thank you very much. Uh, in the end, many of these things come down to questions of not only money, but also, of course, geopolitics and national politics. Robert Niblett is the director of Chatham House, uh, which is one of the leading think tanks on these matters, and I'd like your views, Robin, on uh, is the global community able to come together on this? A lot of our risk management system was a response to the Second World War. Uh, it seems to me to be largely fossilized and not ready for the 21st century challenges. Are we able to evolve rapidly enough to meet these challenges, and how would we do so? Thank you, uh, Ian, for, for the question and for the chance to be able to, uh, to touch on this. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I think we do face a conundrum. As everyone's noted here, we face major transnational challenges that affect all countries in the world, large, small, powerful, not small, uh, climate change, energy security, food security, financial integration. So I think everyone's aware of this interconnectedness. But at the same time, as I look uh, around the world, one of the defining features I see is actually the continuing rise of the nation state, a rise of nationalism, as large powers such as China, India come onto the world stage, they have a very sovereign view of their national interest, not necessarily an integrated view with other countries. 
of their national interest. So we have this irony of a more interconnected world. We've heard all of the various uh, dimensions of it uh, commented earlier. But as I said, a, a, a rise, I think, actually not a diminution of uh, the importance of the nation state, of uh, a feeling of nationalism and a self-awareness. So my problem is, I think, Ian, that, that, that we have a problem. Now, what can you do about it? This is uh, the World Economic Forum is about solutions. Um, I've been a student for a lot of my uh, time in this business of the European Union, uh, one of the first groups of nation states to try to find a way to work multilaterally together. It has some good solutions and it has some bad examples, but I think there are a number of issues that are important. Number one, we need a more legitimate system. And this is where I think the G20 in itself, although still nascent and perhaps inefficient, is a manifestation of a more legitimate, inclusive, forum for the discussion of, of, of global issues, more so than the UN, which by its definition is almost too large uh, to be able to, to act. Number two, um, I think we may have to realize we're going to need subgroups, regional subgroups um, that reflect a commonality of national cultures and perhaps even nation states, groups like the European Union, uh, the G8, which has its own sort of culture of, of economic values and political values, ASEAN, ASEAN plus three, some of the regional groups that are out there. So I think, number one, legitimacy, a large group like the G20. Secondly, some subgroups that can negotiate amongst each other their different perspectives. And thirdly, thirdly, most importantly, I think some of the lessons we've learned from the EU. How do small states make sure that their views are represented in the, between all the big ones? Um, how do you do resource transfers? Almost none of the challenges we talked about here, climate change, can be handled without the transfer of resources between the wealthier uh, and, and the poorer states. And finally, um, legally binding solutions. We may not be able to create one sort of world government to deal with this, but we can have legally binding dispute settlement mechanisms. I think the WTO has proved this is possible, and it's a model that's going to need to be brought in for other sorts of challenges we've talked about here, in particular on the climate change and the resource side. So I think there are, there are ways forward, but we will not be able to move forward if we don't recognize the continuing rise of nationalism and the important role of the nation state, even in an interconnected world with private companies and NGOs and so on in there. Thanks very much, Robin. Uh, by the way, I never mentioned the introduction. I'm not uh, uh, the person that was on the program, Rafael Ramirez, who was down as the moderator. I'm Ian Golden, and I'm the director of the 21st Century School at Oxford University, which is dealing with many of these risks and opportunities. Uh, we have about half an hour, and then we'll come back to the panel again to give the panel some closing time uh, to throw the floor open for discussion. You've had, I think, a wonderfully succinct set of... Uh, uh, points made by the panelists, and uh, so the floor is open to you. If you'd like to direct your questions to any particular panelist, uh, please do so. Uh, if it, please do not make statements. This is not the place to uh, make a long statement about your own points of view. This is really meant to provoke a conversation between us uh, and a conversation which is very succinct to give many people an opportunity uh, to participate. We have translation, uh, and uh, so please uh, do also give the uh, translators a moment to catch up with some of the fast-moving ideas and we have roving mics I see as well. Who'd like to go first? <clears throat> if, uh, if you're still thinking I have some questions <laughs> that I'm going to throw to the panel so why don't we give it one more quick round uh, to the panel then I'll come back to the gentleman there. Uh, all right, oh, hands are beginning to go up uh, so I'll hold back on my questions. The gentleman with the pink shirt, uh, pink jacket over there first. Uh, Please very briefly state your name uh, as well. Uh, George Foster, Stanford University. I had a question in terms of the dangers associated with uh, corruption. I know there's a, a World Economic Forum Council on Corruption and how that is sort of uh, affecting the sort of global mechanisms to put in place and the build up of trust. Okay. I'm gonna collect a few questions. Um, the, the lady right next to you, yep. Selena Lee from China Entrepreneur Club and uh, Green Herald. Um, one, my question is, uh, one of the panelists uh, uh, said that uh, uh, China and India has uh, not uh, very good at uh, integrated view to, um, to deal with the climate change or other global issues. So my question is, uh, what's the role for Western world to lead this kind of issues? 
because uh, China and India is the biggest uh, developing countries in the world. So we would like to integrate it more or invo involved in more. But uh, what's a specific role you would like to, to, to say China or India's role in this kind of global issues? Thank you. We'll take one more question on this round. Maybe two. <laughs> the lady in the front here. The, uh, my name is Yoriko Kawaguchi from the uh, upper house of the Japanese diet. My question is on the information. Uh, no one on the panel mentioned about the role of um, information, uh, dissemination, and also rumors when uh, global risk uh, comes in, becomes an issue. Uh, what sort of, of framework or solutions do we have to control or to disseminate information? Thank you. And uh, the, the gentleman here, uh, one final question in this round. Thank you, Joe Casputis from Global Insight. We talked about uh, health, food, catastrophe, uh, but nobody on the panel mentioned financial risks. Uh, have we cracked that one or are we all just too tired of it? <laughs> Good, yeah. I, I mentioned in my opening statement, but you're right, no one picked it up. Um, Okay, so we have a question on corruption and uh, how this may affect the way we are able to deal with risk or whether that's a risk in itself. We have a question on the role of Asia uh, and both, I think, as a, as a victim of risk, but also more importantly in managing some of these global systemic risks going forward. We have a question on the role of information, I think both in terms of how it spreads rumors and information, but it, has, it may also be uh, management of risk, and I may add another dimension, which is, for example, the collapse of the internet. The information system is also at risk. Uh, which we work on a lot, and then finally on financial risk. Um, I don't want to presume to, to say who on the panel may be best qualified, but what I'd like to do is ask which panelists would like to come in and try and cover the four of them. Robin, uh, uh, Royal of uh, Asia. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll jump in on, on, on a couple of them. And having just come uh, from a, a CEO Insight group that is talking precisely about financial risks. Uh, don't worry, it's definitely going on, in, uh, I think, in some of the other rooms uh, around here, Dalian, at the moment. Uh, but I, I, I think one of the big concerns I heard already this morning uh, on the financial risk side is that governments in particular, having taken this larger role in bringing about stabilization, having invested in and taken over many of the financial institutions in the West, uh, that there may be a political pressure to try to show that a stability has been achieved that isn't actually there that there are still underlying at a consumer risk level, at a commercial property uh, uh, risk level, uh, that in a way we're trying to sort of um, not demonstrate too many of the risks that are still uh, present there because it'll make it a much tougher political step to be able to get out of the financial system. So that's just one comment on financial risk. Two other comments I wanted to make. One was on the role of information. I think this is a vitally important thing. It was on my notes but didn't want to go on for too long. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, very thoughtful um, policymaker in America, has talked about the rise of what he calls a global political awakening fed by the internet, cable television, satellite television. And I think the interesting phenomenon for me in this is that while it's helpful for information to be able to be shared internationally to in engage the population in political discourse, it is limiting the room for maneuver for governments enormously. Governments that may want to act multilaterally but need the space to be able to negotiate an agreement find they have to keep uh, answering in a way to their public at the same time as the public are responding often to, uh, how can I put it, to media forms that play to a lowest common denominator, that, that like pushing the rumor, that like pushing the, maybe the more nationalist position uh, or the more ethnic position. So I'm quite concerned actually that the role of information is something governments have not been able to adjust to yet. Uh, and I don't know what the solution is, perhaps uh, you do, but I'm, I'm, I don't see this as, as an unalloyed positive. And my final comment, uh, about what is the kind of role that the West plays versus rising powers that are still developing like China and India. I think the Western world, uh, in, a way, in the way that it leads, needs to lead primarily financially. Uh, I think opening markets, open trade uh, uh, is beneficial to us, in particular in agriculture, in, in some other aspects that are, of issues that are on the WTO. That can be enormously positive for development around the world. Uh, without us having to necessarily to do physical resource transfers of the sort that are so difficult to do politically. But I think on your side, new infrastructure 
If you're going to be uh, moving and doing this massive development push, putting in sustainable infrastructure will not only be beneficial to China and India in the long term in a growing sense, uh, but also potentially good for some of the big challenges we're facing, climate change, energy uh, insufficiency, etc. Jeffrey, did you want to come in? No, it's okay. Yeah. He said what I had to Okay. Say. Any, anyone else? Uh, you want to say something about corruption? <laughs> yep. Well, just a word on yeah. uh, the financial risks uh, associated with uh, global food supplies. One thing that people don't appreciate, I think, is that uh, if you have an econo a serious economic contraction, uh, people at the lower income levels are hit the hardest. Uh, they tend to then uh, reduce their expenditures uh, on food and move towards the staples. And almost paradoxically, uh, a, uh, con an economic contraction can actually push the prices of your staples up uh, and then making them less available for your, your lower uh, uh, levels of, of society. And what happens then is something that's really quite striking. Uh, a child who's under, uh, say, the age of three, who's calorie, uh, seriously calorie short for just a few months, can be permanently impaired mentally. Uh, what that means is that even a short-term uh, financial uh, crisis that translates into uh, expensive foods can have an impact on society that lasts an entire generation. When did you want to come in on corruption? Uh, not on corruption, actually. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll respond on corruption. Then. You go ahead. Do you want to say something else? Well, uh, a few things. I, I like to be positive, too. I mean, typically when you go to a global risk session, either you are bored or depressed when you go out. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think there are good news here. Just to uh, pick up on your question, ma'am, on uh, what China or India can learn from the Western world. Uh, it's very striking to me the difference between how the United States of America managed Hurricane Katrina versus how China managed the earthquake about 15 months ago. Uh, the way China managed that earthquake is remarkable. I mean, that's been, that's been done from day one to the end of that crisis in a very, very nice way. Uh, I'm saying that, I've been working with the Chinese authority on that, but today that's one of the most uh, remarkable story in how a country manage a large-scale disaster. So, I mean, there are lessons already learned from China, I don't know about India on that, but from China for sure, uh, about how you can manage that. On information, again, to be positive, uh, information systems have played a major role in terms of uh, alerting people. Uh, not always, we can do much better than what we're doing, but I think in terms of alerting people, uh, sharing information almost within 10 seconds all over the world. Uh, WHO has been doing a, a good job on, uh, on the current pandemics because they can interact with each other. So I think the role of information will be more and more critical. Uh, on a financial crisis that, that deserve like a two-day workshop in itself, um, I may be less positive on that for two reasons. One is that it sounds like we just had a car accident and we have been injured but not that much and people are driving fast again. Uh, typically, when you have a car accident, you have to reflect on what happened. Perhaps you were driving too fast, or much too fast. I think that's what happened. I'm not that optimistic because uh, from a risk management view, what's the incentive for me or you to invest in proper risk reduction measures if you know that whatever you do, you're going to be bailed out? Uh, that's a fundamental question to put at the agenda. Uh, that was true for natural disaster to a very small extent. Now you're talking about trillions of dollars. I mean, now if you say a natural disaster costs 25 billion dollars, people are smiling. 25? Forget about that. If you're not talking about a trillion dollars, you don't matter. So um, I mean, the moral hazard aspect uh, related to, uh, to being bailed out, whatever you do, is, uh, is critical, I think. No, the numbers change. Yeah, Jeffrey, quickly. One yeah. small remark, just to say that um, one of the challenges, I think, when we discuss risk is there is no science of risk. Risk is still not a, prob not a characteristic that is well-defined generically. How do we compare, say, the risk of a tsunami with the risk of an earthquake with the risk of a stock market crash? So what we're dealing with is, so to speak, the science and statistics of outlying events. What are the probabilities for extraordinarily outlying events? Because almost the entire structure of society, the way we interact to our economy, to the way our markets are set up, actually presumes there are no outlying events, that everything is smoothly connected with what came before. 
And um, one of the things I think that uh, the, uh, the new developments in complexity science has done is started to focus on some of these really uh, difficult and challenging questions in order to put a quantitative measure and a predictive measure on questions of risk. And let me just pick up on the question on corruption. Uh, the cancer of corruption is pervasively influential on risk from decisions about uh, how buildings are built and the potential to subvert, for example, regulations on construction from dams to houses to office buildings, allowing people to live on floodplains because they bribed an official uh, to allow them to do so, or officials made money, uh, puts them at much risk and society at risk. And of course, at a much bigger level, uh, ensuring that we get the right priorities. And there's some systems which are being corrupted by risk. For example, the internet system uh, is in grave danger of being taken over by spam, fraud, and other corruptive practices. Uh, that could bring an end to one of the most important developments of the 21st century. So this is an extremely important element. Uh, it's a cancer, and it needs radical and urgent treatment in all societies. Uh, let's open up for another round. The gentleman over there. Uh, my name is Richard Hickson from Hill and Associates in Singapore. Um, we've heard quite a lot from the panel about the kind of macro uh, and policy dimensions of the of the risk environment in which uh, in which we all live. The question I'd like to ask is: um, Corporations have to exist and operate in this environment. To what extent have the panel seen corporations acknowledge the risks and do anything um, proactive? to mitigate them, which, and to what degree have those measures been successful? Let's pick up a couple of other uh, questions. Sorry, the, the gentleman and lady in the middle here. This was the microphone. Uh, uh, one minute to sure, sure. get the headphones sure. connected. Well, the one is, uh, you My question is like this. Today we are talking about global risk. We are paying attention to two risks. One is the financial crisis. The financial crisis will be over within three to five years. So we are concerned about the financial risks. The major reason for this financial risks and uh, deregulation. However, we should not deny, deny there are cyclical problems. So this problem will be overcome by three to five years. However, the second problem, that is the climate change. Climate change exaggerates every risk, and the climate change will be faced by all of us within a long period of time. And IPCC of UN proved that climate change come off for human-made reasons. So these are our common responsibility and a common endeavor. You um, believe that this is a differentiated responsibility among different nations. Everybody are expecting Copenhagen meeting can come up with a better consensus and a better solution to, to solve this global climate issues. So we want to listen to your answers to Copenhagen results. Second, what kind of role can Davos Forum play in this regard? Thank you. Uh, the lady next to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've, I'm from the Xinhua News Agency, and I have a question to Niblet. And I'm very interested to his topic of nationalism. And uh, uh, currently, the topic of trade protectionism is very hot uh, globally. So do you think it can help the econ global economy to relaunching and all it, uh, whether it has some bad effects to the global economy? Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman right in the back here, Be behind you, at the, yeah. Sorry, need a microphone. No, no, you do need it for the translation. Uh, hi, I would like to hear... Just you state your name. Oh, Aaron back from Dow Jones. Uh, I would just be interested to hear people address the risk of uh, overreaction to perceived risks. For example, in the financial arena, a lot of peel, people feel that the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley legislation overreacted 
and has created a lot of side effects in the financial arena. And you know, to take another example, related to the information topic that we were talking about, um, you know, in Xinjiang at the moment, a lot of people are afraid of syringe attacks, and it's created a huge, a huge problem in, in Xinjiang. Thank you. Thank you. What, one more question? No? All right, let's come to the panel. Um, Pierre, I'd like you to, to respond to the question of what corporations uh, might be able to do and how active they are in managing some of these uh, systemic risks. Sure, Ian. It's an excellent question. I think we've seen a, a, uh, an amazing change over the last few years now from the perspective as, uh, of a, uh, um, a, a corporation in terms of what is expected from us uh, in risk management systems, strategic early warning systems, and how we deal with them internally. This has uh, become a lot more refined over the last few years, and uh, various uh, requirements have been put on uh, corporations from regulators and um, uh, third-party partners. Uh, we're still not where it should be. And what we clearly see is that a lot of the risks that we have been facing over the last 10, 15 years were ones that came slowly, and we typically react retroactively to risks that have caused significant damage. Um, the more important thing, I think, is to create a more perspective view on how to manage these risks. I would like to look at the other um, side of the coin a little bit more in detail, however. Risks are also business opportunities, and uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs here in this room, and uh, this is what this conference is ultimately about. It's about growth. It's about how we can deal with growth also in the business environment as a subgroup of this conference. And uh, if we look at what is happening, risks are creating seismic rifts in many different areas of industry, creating opportunities for fast-moving companies to emerge and to address risks with new solutions and thereby create very substantial business opportunities that at the same time can provide tremendous value back to society. And I think that will become increasingly important going forward to have these two sides of the coin, especially if we're thinking about uh, attracting talents. Um, talents uh, are looking for ways to change the world for the better increasingly. And uh, if we can combine the two things together, I think it is a very important uh, way of doing business. Oh, and there's a question about whether deregulation and lack of ethics has exaggerated uh, risks. What would be your response be? Well, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Owen. I think that, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's true and not true. The question is who's regulating? Uh, if you're talking about elected officials, they're reacting to what their constituency are asking. Um, I mean, the financial crisis is, is, is dramatic but funny in a way because obviously it's so huge that no one is responsible uh, or no one claimed to be responsible. Uh, states are saying that uh, big banks should have done their own uh, risk management strategy before going in very uh, uh, dirty assets. Uh, these banks are complaining about the lack of regulation, which is kind of uh, a paradox. Uh, some of these banks are complaining about rating agencies not doing their job. So everybody is complaining about other people, uh, when in reality, well, sometimes you have to stand up and look at what your responsibilities are. Uh, over real, I think I, I tend to agree with Sarban Oaks. I think that was definitely a reaction, a very quick reaction to uh, a crisis, a political reaction to a crisis. Uh, has been, uh, has been a positive thing about Sarban Oaks, but a lot of negative things, a lot of extra costs that could have been avoided for many uh, corporations worldwide. So that's on, on over-regulation. Uh, just w one point that, uh, that you mentioned, which I think is, is critical. If whatever your business you're in, if you strongly believe, I, as I do, that you will see more and more <coughs> catastrophes or risks because we are more and more interdependent, which means that an earthquake in China is not just a Chinese issue. That had become actually the number one issue for Lee Scott when he was the CEO of Walmart because 80% of the uh, suppliers of Walmart are here in China. So if you believe that we are more and more interdependent, these risks are more and more interdependent as well. So you will be affected by things that you have not thought about before because they are radically outside of your uh, normal operation. Uh, just to, uh, to conclude here, there are already, already major, major business opportunities for what I call risk management 2.0. To answer your questions here, if you're running a big company or a small company, and your question is how can we do to protect our assets, you're really in risk management 1.0. I mean, you're already late. That's not the issue anymore. Uh, you have to address that, but the real issue is how can I make money 
in a risky environment. And on the financial side, you have new financial products be being created by uh, smart insurance companies and reinsurance companies today that didn't exist five or ten years ago. And you're talking about uh, billions of dollars of market here. Robert, I think uh, you're the environmentalist on our panel. Could you say something about the prospects uh, for Copenhagen and uh, whether we're going to get risk mitigation on climate change quick enough, big enough to mitigate? Uh, that's a pretty big question. We've been uh, trying to get agriculture on the agenda. From my perspective, it's an agriculture question because, and I don't think agriculture and environment are actually independent affairs. Uh, uh, whether it will, will move uh, uh, to the uh, level of importance, I'm not, I'm not convinced. I think we, in terms of uh, agriculture the, and the environment, we have to move toward an, uh, an adaptation frame of mind rather than a, uh, than a, uh, a mitigation. Uh, now, just a quick question. I was intrigued by the question about, um, about uh, overreaction. Uh, there was the, the, uh, some of the conventional wisdom during the, the food price spikes in the 2007-2008 the were that they were triggered by panicked governments, uh, Vietnam, India, for, uh, to, in terms of rice, of blocking their, their exports, and that then sent, uh, uh, sent prices through the roof as, as other governments panicked about supplies. Uh, if you look at the case of India, uh, their reaction quite possibly driven by uh, political considerations, among others, ended up in India uh, having very large stockpiles of rice and wheat. This year, their monsoons have nearly failed. Uh, if they did not have those stockpiles, they would be in a very bad way. So I guess when you try to judge whether someone is overreacting, you need to ask yourselves over what time frame are we going to decide whether there's been an overreaction, mm -hmm. and what are our criteria for determining determining what an overreaction is and from whose perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, oh, do you want to come in on this point, Jeff? I want to come on under risk and companies briefly. Okay. Yep. Just very, very briefly. Brief. Yep. Um, I've been uh, working with Boeing, which is a company, a major company, that is extraordinarily concerned with risk. And uh, one of the things that it did to mitigate risk in its new 787 was to make it multinational and distribute the, not only the profits, but the risk worldwide. That was its idea. And uh, that has actually worked remarkably well as a new uh, business uh, paradigm for them. The problem was that they didn't understand the dynamic, namely the, the risk of failure is not now whether the plane won't work, the risk of failure is that it's two years late. So instead of having to sell 200 planes uh, to make a profit, they have to sell 500 planes to make a profit. And if they do it again, they're finished. That is the next plane if they do the same thing again. So what they recognized is they need to understand the network dynamics of the way innovation flows and risk is distributed. And I think more and more companies we see are more and more getting concerned that they need to understand, I hate to use this word, the science behind the way in which they operate. And I think that's a crucial part long term of the way of dealing with risk across the whole spectrum of problems from the environment, agriculture, health, urbanization, and so on. Absolutely. Uh, Robin, a particular question was posed to you on whether <clears throat> nationalism, protectionism are great risk now and uh, how we can mitigate that. Well, I think the, the remarkable thing of this particular economic crisis we've gone through is that there hasn't been an enormous rise in protectionism. Um, now, admittedly, the World Bank came out with a study, I think a good six months ago now, saying that 17 of the 20 G20 nations had imposed new trade barriers um, since the financial crisis started. The bulk of these were in the non-tariff barrier area, standards, uh, customs regulations, photosanitary regulations. So th these are ways, I suppose, of, of being able to uh, insert elements of protectionism without undermining the overall open market system, which still exists. And this leads me to believe that uh, those governments are trying to manipulate somewhat the economic environment in which they have to interact. Uh, but at the same time, the commitment to open markets over the long term, over the long term, in my opinion, um, is reasonably positive. 
Simply put, governments can't afford not to have open markets at the moment for the flow of finance, for the flow of trade, for the flow of goods. Wherever you are uh, on the value chain, developing country, developed country, you're relying, in essence, on open markets to be able to retain your political position. Whether that means we get progress on WTO, uh, on the Doha negotiation, I'm not sure. I don't know what to say on this. I think politically it would be great if it happened. I think it would have beneficial economic effects. But the fact that we've got to uh, undercut this, this uh, agricultural issue uh, makes me not cautious, but I, I suppose I, I'd like to be hopeful. One, one specific uh, answer to the question about um, overregulation, as it was about Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, as somebody who lives in London, uh, let me just say that uh, it strikes me that already the idea of wanting to maintain competitiveness as financial centers, this is something that governments around the world want to have. It's not just a London or a New York or a Dubai question. Uh, everyone wants to have competitive financial centers and to be able to attract them to their particular shores and into their tax jurisdictions. Uh, and so I think that's going to create a limiting effect on excessive regulatory uh, imposition uh, to the frustration of southern governments, certainly. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one quick round of questions and responses. Do keep your questions and responses uh, as brief as possible to fit this in. Uh, I see gentlemen in the front here, gentlemen in the back there, uh, and the lady. Why don't we take the two here and the gentleman there? Yeah, start in the front. Uh, thank you. From Oriental Morning Post in Shanghai, I will ask my question in Chinese. Thank you. The question I would like to ask is that for people to be addicted to the internet, whether that can constitute a danger or risk. A, a historian has also said whether our material life can progress, our spiritual life can progress with our material life is a problematic issue that we have to discuss. And right now the problems of our teenagers is that a lot of them are addicted and hooked onto the internet. So do you think that's going to be a problem, especially taking consideration of the manufacturers of the 3G or mobile phones or the internet portal companies, uh, do they need to undertake some of the responsibility? Oriental Morning Post. Um, we can often hear the global leaders call for more mutual trust whenever they are talking about the restructuring of a financial system or to achieve new social compacts. Um, but uh, at times I'm wondering that if this, uh, we, we really can call this a uh, trust risk or uh, excuses when we couldn't find the right answer. So I want to hear your voice. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Chapman, uh, and I spend a lot of time in the Middle East. I would like to ask the panel to react to uh, one huge risk which has not been mentioned at all. That is the risk of terrorism, which stems from political problems which appear unsoluble. Thank you. Couple more hands, Just quick questions. The lady over here. Yes. I'm, uh, my name is Abdel Mahdi um, from Sudan. I just wanted to return to the issue of food security and the issue of corruption. Um, the consultative group for agricultural research had recently uh, issued a report uh, warning against uh, the issue of corruption and food security in countries where land is abundant and uh, where uh, countries seeking uh, food security uh, were coming into these land abundant countries and seeking, uh, uh, um, seeking business opportunities. And there's a lot of corruption going on. And to what extent do you feel that this is really an issue and uh, the negative impact for these countries because there's a lot of corruption and, uh, and, and politics involved. Uh, and to what extent these, uh, this is really an issue. Um, Sudan is one of the countries, also Madagascar, Mozambique, and Philippines. And, and, and I would like your comments on this. Thank, thank you Thank you very much. much. Um, we have uh, seven minutes left. I'd like to make some closing comments. Each panelist has less than a minute uh, to respond. Uh, so please be very brief. Uh, I think why don't we start with you, Robert, a uh, question on food security and corruption, Sudan. 
I think that's a, an extremely good question. Uh, it's been in the news, the term land grab is used. I think that uh, we need to distinguish the opportunities that are there uh, uh, in areas that are land rich and labor poor. Uh, I think there is an opportunity, uh, if managed properly, to, uh, to, to transform some of these areas into productive areas that could contribute to global food security. I think there are two issues that we have to be careful of. One is making sure we do this in a way that is environmentally sustainable and doing so in a way that's socially sustainable. I believe it is an opportunity. It is up to us and uh, those we work with to make sure that we don't squander that opportunity. Thank you. Uh, quick closing. Don't feel you have to respond to all, and I'm happy to sweep up some of the responses uh, in the end. Sure. Should I go? Uh, I see Klaus in the room. We had a session with Klaus as part of the Young Global Leader um, work we're doing here with the firm on the redesign, Global Redesign Initiative. Uh, to talk about financial coverage here, at the end of the day, whatever you do, I think I tend to agree, you have to be able to measure it, whether it's complexity or, or any type of risk. So what you can measure, you can, you can manage. Uh, on the financial risk aspect or financial coverage, we have seen a tsunami in thinking. I mean, that's really the expression I'm going to use here. A radical change in how insurance markets, countries are looking at these global risks today in a way that uh, we're very, very far away from that five or 10 years ago. Uh, just last sentence, uh, that means for you as organization, you first have to be on risk management 1.0, as I mentioned, which is, okay, what type of risk can affect my company internally, but also externally? And when you've done that, and there are people on this panel that can help you to do that. When you've done that, you can switch to risk management 2.0, which is how can I benefit from that? Uh, if you're not even at 1.0, you're in big trouble. Thank you. Uh, Pierre? I'd like to take the question on the internet, which I think is uh, very, very interesting, and, and maybe compare it uh, just to evolution in general and be a little bit uh, academic about it. We're currently leaving a well-trodden path in the way uh, our uh, new generations are growing up and the way they are interacting with each other. We don't really know where this is going. It could be a dangerous path uh, because basically the interactions, the partnerships uh, could be going in a direction which could have an adverse effect on society overall. Uh, this is a risk that I think is still underestimated that we first have to understand where it could go to try to be able to create measures and influence uh, the system into the right direction. I see this as a great risk. Uh, it's still at a very early stage, but uh, could become uh, quite meaningful going forward. Thank you. Jeffrey? Yeah, I'll take off from the, what you just said. Um, one thing we do know if we think about sustainability and the questions of risk is that there is uh, one system we're very familiar with that is extraordinarily sustainable to all kinds of changes and perturbations and so on, and that's life. Life, biological life has evolved and adapted over more than a billion years and uh, in an extraordinary way is extraordinarily robust and resilient. We can ask the same kinds of questions about society, social human beings who diverted from the natural kind of evolution and ask what are the things that have dramatically changed from, the, from biology to human social organizations, whether it be a city, a company, a nation, or a small community, and the major things that have changed is that life, biological life, is dominated by economies of scale, whereas social organizations are dominated by wealth creation and innovation. And those two things are diametrically opposed because economies of scale means you get less, you want less for more, and wealth creation means you want more for less. And those are tremendously in, in, in conflict, and they do lead to one major crucial constraint, and that is in biology, when you grow, you grow and you stop growing, and you're stable and sustainable. No one in this room is growing upwards anymore. Maybe growing upwards, not upwards. Uh, on the other hand, social organizations are openly growing and non-sustainable in that sense. And it is only by continuous innovation on a faster and faster treadmill that we can survive, and that's why we have a serious problem. Thank you. Uh, Robin. Well, very quickly, no one's taken the terrorism question, hugely important uh, question for the future. 
A, because in increasingly integrated markets and the kind of just-in-time life that we work in, terrorist organizations can have massive impact in disrupting that world. I lived in Washington for 10 years. It took over a year to clean out the Brentwood mail facility where the anthrax-laden envelopes passed through. Over a year before people could work in that building again. And that was a, uh, you know, one uh, minor, I suppose, a, to a certain extent, terrorist attack. The key question for me is, are we talking about uh, international terrorism, sort of anarchic groups, which I think will continue to be dissatisfied with the world? We must be very careful not to conflate that with nationalist groups uh, that are, in essence, insurgencies that use terrorism, terrorist means to try to achieve their goals. I think Al-Qaeda, in my opinion, is going to burn itself out in a way. It, its very methods are turning people off. But I think the, the push and the desire for justice at a national and at a local level uh, uh, will continue to pr drive people to use asymmetric means, uh, the, the way that the, the weak try to overcome the large uh, and the strong. That will continue well into the future. How to deal with that is down to local solutions. Thank you very much. Let me just make uh, some concluding uh, thoughts uh, by, by way of trying to bring the panel together and also to respond to some of the questions that haven't uh, yet been responded to. What the 21st century is bringing is both this extraordinary integration and interdependence as well as leaps in technological change. Those leaps liberate us. They create the internet, for example, cures for cancer, and many other developments which will allow us to deal and to liberate energy in education. The internet allows a poor child in a poor village to have the same information as someone at Oxford. This is incredible and allows the potential for the first time in humanity of millions of more children to have opportunity and to create innovation and wealth. At the same time, these instruments provide the potential for our downfall. The risk is small. The long tail is low, but it is wagging more and more aggressively. And that's because of this interdependence. It's also because of the power of individuals. Single individuals can bring down the internet. They could create new bioweapons that lead to new pandemics, destroying much of humanity. And so how one builds mutual trust, which was another question raised, is absolutely key in this. Let me end with some comments about the World Economic Forum and its potential role, which is so significant in this. The actors in this have to come together from governments, from business, and from civil society broadly. And it has to be a global initiative which is not biased by the politics of today and the nationalism which drives so much of politics. It needs to be something that stands above. And so the global uh, mission is to develop a capacity to think about the deep issues in a way which transcends the national. And the forum is able to do that. This meeting of new champions is testimony to that. The risk report which the uh, World Economic Forum produces on an annual basis is another one. It is a deep intellectual effort to help us raise awareness. And I hope that one of your takeaways will be from today that we need to think much deeper about it. The probabilities of risk are always low, but just as they don't stop us having an insurance for our car or fire alarm systems in our homes and hotels, they shouldn't stop us thinking about the big issues. The probability is there that there will be global catastrophic risks. We see natural disasters affecting the poor and the most vulnerable more and more every day. And so we need to ensure that we mitigate this risk and that this 21st century becomes the century of opportunity, not of global collapse and failures. The other risk we face, of course, at Davos is running out of time, and so I'd like to bring the session to a close and thank this wonderful panel for its contributions. Thanks to you all, and thanks to the audience for yours. Oh, Klaus, wonderful to, to see you here. This is the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, and we're honored by your presence. Thanks.